acts of unbelief assume that man is careful and God is careless of the church, and that man acting in disobedience can be accepted. How do you like that? Well, it's the truth, isn't it? In Saul's first obedience, he acts without regard to God's command. In his second obedience, he acts contrary to it. The word of the Lord was clear. He was to smite Amalek utterly. And should we save any of our flesh men alive to trouble us another day? Instead, he saves the king and the best of the spoil. His excuse was that they were for sacrifice unto the Lord. His apology was not accepted, and the prophet shows him God's heart. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings as in obeying his voice? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. That's from 1 Samuel fifteen twenty-two and 23. The literal command to smite Amalek and all that he has has passed away with its dispensation, but in spirit this word is still binding. Amalek was Esau's son, and he is a type of fleshly strength. He foreshadows the elder son, for that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Esau and Amalek portray that which is first and natural, the strength of the flesh, the rejected firstborn, as distinguished from the new creature or the new creation man. And the Lord still has war with Amalek from generation to generation. And if you've been in that war, you know what I'm talking about. And then we have to know that Saul kept the best things. Yes, the flesh offers good things. It is a mistake to think the flesh has nothing but what is vile. The natural man has many good things that seem desirable. In every town we move to, the temptation is put before me to become involved with all the good things of Amalek, but I cannot. The Spirit constrains me from joining myself either to his evil things or his good things, for there is no life in any of it. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. God will not have our honey, our good, on the altar any more than he will have our leaven, our baddies. It is all from one and the same source. In the types in scripture, the Jew is the elder son. In him we see that which is first and natural. Paul tells us of the good things he might glory in, in Philippians 3, 4-6. Circumcised the eighth day, he says, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Here we have birth in the flesh of Abraham's seed, the right administration of carnal ordinances, connection with the most distinguished part of Israel, blameless moral conduct, religious zeal. These are all the good things man can do without grace. All the religiousness of the natural heart, zeal for the temple and its gold, building the tombs of the prophets, honoring the dead prophets and ignoring the living ones, garnishing the sepulchres of the righteous, glorifying past saints, but not recognizing that the same God is in us to do his will. They say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Present-day Amalek is known by a desire to be something or to have something here. In contrast, Paul counted all that had been gained to him as a loss and even as dung. He was of the true circumcision who rejoiced in Christ Jesus and had no confidence in the flesh. Among carnal ministries, we see the good things of the flesh are spared and not judged. A pastor wrote to us to confess that he had never understood before that the Lord didn't want our goodness any more than our leaven. It was a revelation to him. I'd call it step one on the ladder of death to self. Vicarial rule always approves of sparing and using the flesh in God's service, but to its own glory. We see the wisdom of the flesh in places where it should never be. 
in entertainment in the church, trying to make the truth of God more palatable to the world. We see the affections of the flesh introducing things of the world into the church. Any objection is silenced because it is sacrificed to the Lord. The religion of the flesh is spared and not judged. We hear in the news that sexual sins have been committed by priests against children in their care. When it came to light, instead of judging the matter, the authorities would simply transfer the offender to another place. When God's will is put away, our wisdom will soon imitate Saul. The best of Amalek will be spared, while one boasts that he has obeyed the Lord. This self-justification but increases the sin. It shows how little we know his mind and purposes toward the elect, or the flesh, against which his judgment is sealed. God's answer to this is, To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Many believers know not the purpose of God in his acts of grace and judgment. The casting off of Esau and his seed, the call of Jacob, the bringing of the elect over Jordan, the purpose of these things were nothing to Saul. To many who name the name of Christ today, these things also mean nothing. What is taught is the rejection of the Jew, how it seals the death and worthlessness of the flesh. What is taught is the call of the church, how its new heavenly life affect the flesh nature. To summarize why Saul lost the kingdom, we look at this. Disobedience first and last. Disobedience in acting without a command from God. Disobedience in acting contrary to his command, in sparing for sacrifice what God had devoted to judgment. In the church, unbidden and forbidden acts are done as service or sacrifice to the Lord. The greatest service is, they also serve who only stand and wait. And now we want to compare the position of the two kings. We trace Saul's history now from the time of his rejection until his death. There we learn one of our last lessons and the soonest one to be forgotten. From Abel to our day, God's witnesses have been strangers here. We are still surprised that if we are faithful, we must be cast out. We can't believe our portion is to be rejected here. If that surprises us, look at God's position in his own church. Is the Lord walked with? Is he received? Is not man continually put in his place? Has his name not been cast out as evil to be used in anger and blasphemy by base men? John one ten and 11 tell us, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. This fact clearly unveils man's heart. God comes into his world doing good, but the world has no room for him. They judge him as an impostor. His people's answer to his deeds of love was, By what authority do thou these things? Their hearts reveal their true values when the mob cried, Not this man, but Barabbas. I recall an incident from The Hiding Place, a story of a Dutch family who were jailed for hiding Jews in their home. Every Friday, Corey and Betsy Ten Boom would be stripped naked for a medical inspection. The corridor where the prisoners stood in line was very cold, and the guards stood ogling them as they passed by. They were even forbidden to wrap themselves with their own arms. It was during one of these times of humiliation that a verse in the Bible leapt into life. He hung naked on the cross. Cory said she had not known or even thought why, all the paintings and carved crucifixes showed at least a scrap of cloth. She suddenly knew that was the respect and reverence of the artist. On that other Friday morning, there had been no reverence. She leaned toward Betsy and whispered, Betsy, they took his clothes too. A little gasp and a whisper, Oh, Carrie, and I never thanked him. When we read this aloud, Bill and I were moved to pray and thank the Lord for humbling himself before his creation in order to show them his great love. 
Why should it be that man reacts in such rejection of his Maker? It must be that God's presence and truth ever judge man. God is light and shows things as they are, and proud man can't hear this. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. That's Ephesians 5.13 Man would still hide his nakedness, for the light exposes him. His only choice is to humble himself or reject the light. If he will not be humbled, the light must be cast out, be it Jesus or his witnesses. These truths may explain something of the position of Saul and David respecting Israel. One has all Israel with him, and the other a despicable remnant. The one lives at ease, and the other is driven from place to place. The one had all Israel. He rules them as he will, and they obey. It matters not that Saul has been rejected by God, has disobeyed God's prophet, is stained with the blood of God's priests, and seeks the life of God's anointed king. Does this remind you of any modern leader? At his word the people come against David, even though he has delivered them, time and again from the Philistines. Every person in the Bible figures some mind or affection which springs out of human nature. Philistines represent worldly knowledge. Saul can't ever defeat worldly knowledge, because that is what he leans on. Answer this question from your own experience. Who rules in the church today? Whom do the great mass of churchgoers follow? At whose bidding do they move? Are they with the king after man's heart, or with that rule that witnesses for God? David is still a stranger among his own people. God's rule has been usurped by man, and Saul's rule is still evident on every hand. Man rules for God instead of God by man. Like David's men, the debtors and distressed ones even today learn the trials and the blessings of those rejected by their brethren who still walk with God. God is still a sufficient portion. This we learn through despair of ourselves. The emptier we are of self, the more room there is for God to reveal himself. Where we are something, God will not be all. If we would be true kings and rule in the kingdom, we need to learn the lessons that David learned in his trials. He never exalts himself. When Saul is pursuing him, he still witnesses that the living God is a sure refuge. In this humble state, we learn God's goodness and man's wretched failure. It is more than a doctrine. Often we walk and are led with little understanding of our way. We find ourselves living a life full of inconsistencies. I have to stop and have a little drink. One might conclude that David's course lacks power because it exposes the weakness of the flesh. Saul's custom was to gather all Israel to battle, but for all that he couldn't defeat a Goliath. David comes alone, and God is there. Isn't that something? Even after he is cast out and hunted, he still does what Saul cannot. He smites the enemy again and again, and blesses Israel with the spoil. He has power with God even in his humbled, persecuted state. Isn't it the truth? In his last battle, Saul takes all his men and still has no victory. He is forced to flee, until at last he and his three sons fall in Mount Gilboa. Before he was rejected, he overcame Moab, Ammon, and Edom. Notice, these are all nations on this side of Jordan, next to the wilderness. Saul never meddled with the Jebusites who held Jerusalem, and had no success with the Philistines who lived over Jordan. See this in the Spirit. A false king who is ruled by self can never win a victory over wicked spirits in heavenly places. They are beyond him because he has never possessed that spiritual land. David, on the other hand, is victorious on both sides of Jordan. 
And David represents that remnant who are called God's sons because they are led by the Spirit and let Him rule. Don't you like that? When we see that Saul represents rule in the organized church, while David stands for the rule of God which is being wrought out in the remnant, it is meaningful to compare the relative position of Saul and David to each other. In the early part of their relationship, an evil spirit from God, would you believe? Get that. From God troubles Saul. That's in 1 Samuel 16 and 14. He is comforted by the soothing tones of David's harp. Saul comes to love him for the peace that he ministers to him. But this love isn't very deep and doesn't last very long. After David's victory over Goliath, Saul becomes jealous. He begins persecuting him, and then he seeks his life in earnest. When David comes, Saul seems to have forgotten him when he asks, Whose son is this? Though comforted by David's harp, he really never knew him. David, on his part, refuses to take Saul's life. His place is yet to wait on God. He refused to take his deliverance into his own hands. These two typical kings tell us that there are that there are evils in the church to be judged. All antichrist forms will know the Lord's judgment. The true remnant is to separate from such, even though they suffer at their hands. Often the greatest suffering is that they never knew me, even as they did not know our Lord. One unfailing mark of communion with the Lord is the ability to discern God's work and workmen in the church and in the world. The teaching of God gives the capacity to recognize His true servants here, while the veil of humiliation and the working of the cross is on them, and while they are a gazing stock to the world. As of old, the common people recognized in the poor, despised, humbled Nazarene, the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Once again it is, flesh and blood cannot reveal it, but the Father which is in heaven. Personal communion with Him will determine a person's measure of God's thoughts. Babes in the Lord are weak or ignorant of His mind. How humbling it is to the flesh to find that those who make the greatest progress in communion with God are the least worthy of such blessing. The needy are readier to know their need. If they have not God's strength, they are helpless. If they have not God's wisdom, they are fools. Their very necessity casts them on God. Their need for Him determines their capacity to find Him when the wise see Him not. We often hear from those whom the Lord has brought out of the church system to be taught of Him and prepared to enter into His fullness. They express their heart and concern over what their brethren, yet in the system, think of them. They may receive comfort to see the opinion of God's remnant in David's day. The scriptures faithfully record for our comfort the opinions of Nabal, of Jonathan, of the Adalamites, and all Israel. These were all called of God, but how different their views of David and his band Nabal was of Caleb's house, so he was closely related to David. He was a man of great wealth. David had the responsibility of feeding around 600 men every day, and he couldn't just go to a store and buy what was needed or walk into a restaurant. He heard that Nabal was shearing sheep this day, and that meant there would be plenty of food prepared. Perhaps they could spare some for them. After all, they had watched over Nabal's shepherds and kept them from harm all the time they were camped near them. David sent ten young men to say, Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. Nabal's rough answer showed his proud heart. Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers, and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? This was a true anointed king he was talking about, the one who had slain Goliath and many times delivered Israel from the Philistines. This was too much for David. 
He didn't call for the ephod this time. His pride was hurt, and he told his men, Gird ye on every man his sword, and he marched to Nabal's place to make him eat his words. Before he arrived, one of Nabal's young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, about David and his band. They were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. But evil is determined against our master, and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial, or worthlessness, that a man cannot speak to him. Though inheriting the possessions from Caleb, the reward of Caleb's faith, Nabal was churlish, rude, bad-tempered in his ways. The riches that God gave he regards as his own. Abigail was of a different spirit. She quickly gathered together provisions for David's band and set out to meet him. When David came into view, she fell at his feet and made intercession. Upon me, my lord, upon me let this iniquity be. Let not my lord regard this man of Belial, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal, or foolish, is his name, and folly is with him. The Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. It almost seems like she is prophesying to him, so precious are her words. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man, Saul, is risen to pursue thee, and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound up in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord shall have done, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. This word brought David to his senses, and he thanked Abigail. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Do you see the heart of the man? This is from First Samuel 25. This remnant today anointed and in training to be true kings, can see by David's example that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. It helps to remember that the riches of his word have been committed to them. And why should they be angry at those who do not know the things of their inheritance? Rather, their attitude should be, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, Nabal had great riches, three thousand sheep, one thousand goats, a good land, fountains and brooks, all the riches of that dispensation. And from his riches he despised David and his band. But now we have spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The riches of Canaan were but types of spiritual riches which God gives the church as risen with Christ, who have passed over Jordan the death to self-life. A rich Israelite in our day is not a Christian rich in this world's goods, like uh, some evangelists would try to convince you, but one rich in gifts for feeding souls. Some undiscerning ones still equate riches with spirituality. If they are rich, they think the Lord must surely be with them, and they surely must have the truth, so I am safe in following them, uh, people feel. Gifts are not always found with David. Gifts may be coveted to make us something when we are set on high. It is harder to be nothing in the eyes of men. Spiritual riches may also be a snare, tempting us to judge that spirit which needs God every hour. Spiritual gifts may be had by the carnal. They are no mark of spirituality, for they are given to the rebellious also. The Corinthians came behind in no gift, yet their conduct toward Paul was like Nabal's. Paul's ministry and spirit rule was like David's. The Corinthians were ready to receive false apostles who would take from them and smite them on the face. This is something that Paul told them in Second Corinthians 11 and 20. Rule which appears to possess strength in itself or which stands in some gift 
will always be received when God's true witness is treated with suspicion. Nabal judges David's way as the fruit of self-will. Like Eliab, his eldest brother, who said, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. Faith's ways and words are still judged by the flesh as naughtiness and pride and rebellion in the eyes of the Lord. The flesh always considers it pride to reckon on a living God. If saints walk carnally, they will echo the judgment of the flesh. Those who have been led out of Babylon they call rebellious and backslidden. Have you ever had that said against you? I'm sure you have. You are in good company, saints, for so the elect of God has suffered before you. They think nothing of the cost to David to walk this way of yielding his will to God's. It costs something to break ties with family and friends who no longer understand where he walks. He shares the spoil of victories with them and provides defense on every hand. For all this, his place is disreputable in Israel's eyes. Does this sound at all familiar? He must surely be judged as a runaway. They know not whence he is, they say. We turn now to observe Jonathan's opinion of David. Jonathan means Jehovah is giver. Jonathan ever sees in David God's chosen and anointed king. Though he is Saul's son and a part of Saul's system, he loves David to the end. He speaks for him to his father. When David must flee, he enters into covenant with him and his seed. He even tells David of Saul's designs against him. Even while he is a fugitive from his father, Jonathan meets David in the wood and strengthens his hand in God. Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next under thee, and that also my father knoweth. This is from 1 Samuel 23 and 15. His opinion of David reflected God's opinion. Even though he is closely related to the power that hated David, when David is persecuted, Jonathan comforts him. Yet he cast not his lot with David. David abode in the wood, but Jonathan went to his house. <clears throat> to understand the spiritual application, we see today a faithful seed like Jonathan being threatened with death while defending David. Why shall he be slain? What has he done? Saul throws a javelin at him so he sees the price for defending David. Also, when Jonathan and his armor-bearer initiate a great victory, Saul would kill him, his own son. He but tasted of the honey. He performed independent of man's rule, simply by faith in God, a heinous sin to Saul. Yet these are so connected to anti-Christian rule, they cannot leave it. To abide with David is too great a cross. They return back to dwell with that which hates David. Jonathan hopes to see David's glorious rule, but falls as he lives with Saul. To reign in the kingdom we must now suffer rejection in the place of Christ. To see Christ's rule in the mystery of the kingdom, we must share it in his place. Even yet, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? If we would know ruling with God, it must be in separation from Saul. Lastly, we consider the Adullamites' opinion of David. These were the men who followed David. They were called Adullamites because they came from that place in Palestine. But that name is full of meaning. It means a testimony to them. Of all Israel, these few poor debtors give David the place which God gives him. It reminds me of my own family. There are some, like Jonathan, who wish me well, though they are still with Saul. There are others who, like Nabal, say, Who is Elaine? What could she have that we don't have? And then there are the band of Adullamites, my brethren, who walk with me where I walk, and know the way that I take, and understand the pain of being anointed to rule in the kingdom. They bestow upon me more abundant honor, which humbles me. Greatly. David became a captain over this motley crew. The Lord hath sought a man after his own heart and commanded him to be captain over his people. Following his example, they become mighty men. At times, his followers question his thoughts and his will. 
Through severe trials, they almost rebel against him. At times, they even had to hide with the Philistines, but when it came to war with Israel, they refused David's help. They knew he was true and could not join with them against the anointed of God and his own people. He would have to deny himself to take the side of the flesh. Doubtless this band was the jest of those at ease in Zion. But though Abraham were ignorant of them, and Israel acknowledged them not, they are God's remnant. He bears rule over them. They are called by his name. This is from Isaiah 63, verses 16 and 17. Some of the weakest and vilest among the believers are the first to discover where strength is to meet their need. Just as in receiving the gospel, publicans and harlots find the truth when wise scribes miss it, how can that be? Because their misery makes them feel the utter helplessness, hopelessness and helplessness of everything except a living God. The remnant have their eyes opened to see their need of God. I want to share what the Lord used to quicken this word to me and to make me know that I must share it. It seems that one of the biggest struggles a Christian has is to forgive those who wrong him and to keep a right spirit when others treat him unkindly or revile him. In a word, when he is treated like David was in his preparation for ruling and reigning with God. It's all too easy to hold bitterness and hatred in our hearts which affect our health and destroy our joy and peace. The Lord made it very real to me that when we strive against someone whom he has used to do a work in our life, to bring chasing for our rebellion, for example, and refuse to forgive that person and remain angry with them, we are fighting against God's hand. He is using that person as his chastening rod, and if we curse him, we are cursing God. Do you, have you ever thought of it like that? It's true. In the Old Testament, which is God's pattern of his dealings with men, he used rebellious heathen nations to chasten Israel when she was in rebellion against him. He does the same today, except it is a personal, individual dealing with each believer. When I understood this, I knew I needed to share about God's rule in the kingdom. I feel also to share a prophecy the Lord gave me that speaks of God's rule in the earth. Man's house of cards is about to fall down at his feet, and I do have a prepared people who are ready to build and to plant my kingdom in the earth in a measure that no man has seen heretofore. Those who have been watering and bringing illumination, shining upon my precious plants, will now find themselves harvesting. I am taking my body, whom I have finished in my own likeness, who have fashioned in my own likeness, and I am forming them into a new threshing instrument with teeth. They will take the ways of man and beat them small, and cause them to blow away by the wind of my spirit. Fear not anything that comes that seems to be a hardship to the people or a darkening of the earth, but know that I am moving in many ways to shake mankind out of his satisfaction with his own ways, that he will open his eyes and look for a better way. And, my people, you shall show forth the better way, the way of my rule in the earth. For man's kingdoms have held sway and brought forth vanity and heartache, and my creation remains in its bondage. My seventh day rest has come, and I shall cause the earth to cease her struggle to show herself as God and to bring forth righteousness. My own arm shall save, my own arm shall deliver. The earth shall see my willing people in the day of my power. Rejoice to see this day. This is the end of the prophecy. And lastly, I want to share a dream uh, that Julie Book had sent in to us. I was in my car driving up a very steep road, and I was almost at the top of the mountain. The road had become very slippery, and I just couldn't go any further in my car. I was feeling so tired. Suddenly, I could feel the car moving again, and when I looked out my window, I saw that a small group of people had surrounded my car and were pushing it. It wasn't long before we all reached the top of the mountain. I knew I was with people of Israel, and we had finally made it to the border, safety and rest and freedom from the enemy. What a glorious knowing this was. We began to make our way down the other side, but there was no road. 
We've never been this way before, and we were all on foot together, no big eyes or little U's. Being extremely weary, we rejoiced to find a little building where we could rest. This place was filled with light, yet the light did not keep us from resting. Suddenly, the doors burst open, and there before us stood a group of Nazis, fully armed. The Nazis had illegally pursued us beyond their own border. Before anyone else moved, I boldly stood and began to speak with great authority. The Nazi commander spoke out as if with great fear. She is an American. Then I woke up. I asked the Lord what this dream was all about, and he said, You are being embrazened. This is one of those God words that you won't find in the dictionary, but one that means exactly what it sounds like. The main thrust of the dream is that we are being caught up to his throne to be given his authority. And it is in this place that we will have what it takes in Christ to come against the illegal actions of the enemy. Right now, I think many of us have been as David's motley crew, and things have looked pretty impossible in the natural. I'm sure the Lord is preparing us for some kind of illegal onslaught. We know the Lord is going to do what he said. We don't have to worry about how. He'll work that part out. What he tells us, when he tells us what he is going to do, then we can really rest in our circumstances. So let us let God do it. I was not going it alone. There is a remnant group taking this way, and what a comfort this is. We will be tested, when we least expect it, to have to stand and face the enemy in the authority of God. When this happens, he will give us boldness without fear or thought of self, and we will stand up in the power and authority of the Lord to protect those of the remnant of spiritual Israel. We know that the Lord will use the weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So this may be real interesting when the Lord begins to manifest himself in our weak and foolish looking frames. Revelation 12 seems ever so near and is even now unfolding. Bless your hearts. I trust this word has been a blessing and a light to you.